And I want to thank you all for, for bringing me here today. Uh, I speak before a lot of audiences, but I think I enjoy speaking with fair housing folks and people in the housing industry more than others. Uh, they're actually interested in doing something which many of my academic colleagues are not, uh, and, and it makes for a more worthwhile experience. Now, I want to begin with a, with a quote from a person by the name of David Koch. Do, do, do people know who David Koch is? He's a successful businessman. He's a, a philanthropist. He's given a lot of money to the arts. And every once in a while, he talks about politics. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, he gave $25 million to a prep school that he had gone to. And when he made his, uh, his, his speech the day he made the gift, he offered the following observation. You might ask, how does David Koch happen to have the wealth to be so generous? Well, let me tell you a story. It all started when I was a little boy. One day my father gave me an apple. I soon sold it for $5, bought two apples, and sold them for 10 Then I bought four apples and sold them for 20 Well, this went on day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, until my father died and left me $300 million. Um, now, I, I tell this story for a couple reasons. One, I think it tells us something about the nature of the meritocracy that we believe we live in, that, 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 that people get ahead by their hard work and, and, and intelligence. Uh, and it also tells us something about how at least some people trivialize the nature of inequality in, in American society today. And, and there has been a lot of discussion of inequality in recent years uh, from all parts of the political spectrum, left and right. And what I want to talk about today primarily is the role of inequality as both a cause as well as an effect of the financial crisis that we're still dealing with today. I'm going to give you lots of numbers and, and, and the slides will be available. I don't expect you to, 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 to take down everything I'm saying. But the basic message that I want to try to deliver is that the, the, the foreclosure crisis and the financial crisis that we're living with, it's not just that it happens to have a greater impact on low-income people or people of color, but that the structure of inequality that we've been living with for decades is one of the underlying causes of, of the crisis. Uh, just a few tables. Uh, this is a table that sh shows you the share of income held by the top 1%. And I don't know if you can read it here, but what it shows is the, the level of inequality peaked right before the Great Depression and right before the Great Recession. A couple other numbers. This is a, a table that shows you the level of productivity compared to the returns of, of, of several groups of people. Between 1995 and 2011, we see that the economy was very productive it, and the productivity increased by over 37%. But you look at the various groups that I have here, college graduates, uh, the median worker, the high school grad. This comes from the Economic Policy Institute, by the way. It shows that their earnings and their income did not increase by anywhere near this much. So somebody was getting the benefits of this increasing productivity. In other words, the issue we've been dealing with for the last few years is not that in the aggregate our, co our economy hasn't grown or it hasn't been productive. The issue has been the distribution of the rewards from that economic system. This table illustrates the, the relationship between what the typical CEO has earned versus the workers that they manage. And we see from um, roughly through the, from the 70s through the 90s, the ratio was around 31 to 60 to 1. But in the early 1990s, it skyrocketed to the point where it was over 300 to 1, 295 to 1 in 2010, and rising. This is far higher than in any other industrialized country uh, and, and is just another reflection of the nature of inequality in the United States. Here's just some fun numbers. In 2009, John Stump, the CEO of Wells Fargo, took home $21 million. And here you can see how many years various people would have to work to earn what John Stump made in 2009. The president would only have to work 53 years. The average worker would have to work 665 years. Now, keep in mind, this is just one year. I don't know what John Stump's tax returns looked like, but my guess is in 2008 and in 2010, he didn't do too bad in those years either. Uh, this just shows uh, the political contributions, uh, the disparity between what business and labor have provided in, in one year. Uh, a few numbers, and I won't go through all of these, but we see that, that, that in looking at income inequality between 1979 and 2011, the top 1% experienced a 275% increase. Others in the top 20% who were doing pretty well experienced a 65% increase. 
and the bottom 20% and 18%. So what we see is the disparities actually get larger the higher up you go. The difference between, we hear a lot about the 1% and the 99%, those disparities are trivial actually compared to what the top 1 one hundredth of 1% made against the top 1%. Uh, and the, the bottom set, set of numbers I'll point to show that, that household income as a share of white median income for blacks declined from 62% to 58% and for, for Hispanics from 71% to 70%. These are not huge differences, but the point is they were going in the wrong direction. This is another table that illustrates the wealth of the top one-tenth of 1% uh, or the share of, of all wealth held by this group. And we see, again, the top one-tenth of 1% 1 held something like 25% of all wealth uh, right before the Great Depression, and it's reached that level again in 2013 in the middle of, of, of the Great Recession. Let me point to the, the, the middle set of numbers. We see that between 2005 and 2009, all groups lost equity or lost wealth. Whites lost 16% of their wealth, blacks 53%, Hispanics 66%. Uh, and between 2010 and 2013, nobody was doing very well, but in those years, whites had an increase of 2.4%, blacks lost 33%, Hispanics lost 14%. And the last number on this table shows that the top one-tenth of 1% 1 were worth as much as the, ninth, as the bottom 90% in 2013. So, well, let me go back to that a second. So in other words, however you look at it, if you want to look at 1% versus 99%, whether you look at income or wealth, whether you want to look at CEOs versus the average worker, or top wealth earners versus the average worker in American society, there has been a significant increase in inequality over the last 30 years, uh, following four or five decades of significant equalization of income, the so-called Great Compression following the World War II years. Now, what about segregation? Uh, we were told by Ed Glazer and Jacob Victor in a, in a report they issued about two years ago that we have reached the end, the end of the segregated century, that segregation was no longer the issue today that it had been in the past. Uh, and it is the case that nationwide, according to some aggregate numbers, the, dis the, the, the dis disparities with the segregation between blacks and whites has gone down. It, it peaked in the in mid to late 1970s and has gone down slightly since then. But as John Logan at Brown University has shown us that in those communities where the African-American population remains concentrated, that is big cities like Chicago, St. Louis, Cleveland, and so forth, the level, the, the so-called index of dissimilarity remains at 80. 60 is considered hyper-segregated. In these big cities, the level of segregation between blacks and whites has not declined over the last 30 or 40 years. And in looking at the segregation of Hispanics and Asians from whites, we see that those levels of segregation, though much lower than it is with African Americans, uh, has persisted or actually increased slightly. And one of, the, one of the things I think that's important to realize in terms of the national decline in black-white segregation, where you see arguably significant declines, it's in relatively small western and southwestern cities, places like Salt Lake City, Austin, Phoenix, these are cities where if blacks and whites were equally spread out throughout a metropolitan area, whites would rarely encounter any African Americans in their daily routine. So integration there probably doesn't make much difference in terms of their exposure to, to African Americans. In a city like Chicago or St. Louis, obviously it would be a different story. And these aren't just statistical patterns. These aren't just nice numbers that demographers like to play with. I think as everybody in this room probably knows better than I do, that in highly segregated communities, when people are concentrated in poor communities, and particularly poor communities of color, the schools don't work as well. The streets aren't as safe. Uh, the, all, all kinds of public services aren't as effective. Police and fire response time is slower. There are fewer jobs available. It's harder to find healthy, fresh fruit, fruit and vegetables. It's harder to find medical care of any kind. What you do have access to in these neighborhoods is pawn shops and payday lenders and check cashers and other predatory services. A few things about foreclosures. Uh, between 2008 and 2010, almost 5 million families lost their homes. Among borrowers who received loans between 2004 and 2011, 11, I, I'm rather 2008, between 2004 and 2008, 
11% of African Americans, 14% of Latinos lost their home compared to 8% of Asians and 6% of non-Hispanic whites. No great surprise here, but we continue to see traditional racial disparities. A couple of years ago, the Center for Responsible Lending estimated that by 2016 there would be 13 million more foreclosures. The Federal Reserve has estimated that consumers have lost 1.86 trillion in home equity so far. Uh, as the, at the end of 2013, almost 10 million households were underwater, meaning they owed more in their mortgages than their homes were worth. This number's actually gone down quite a bit in 2014. I think it's closer to six or seven million. Um, and I think what's significant here, though, is what we see is the decline in home equity, for reasons that I'll say in, in a minute. Again, we see that, 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 that the home equity declines at the peak of the crisis for whites was a decline of about 17 percent, for blacks a decline of about 23 percent, and for Hispanics a decline of about 51 percent. Now what happened here? What accounted for the, these, these patterns? Why did we see the spike in foreclosures, uh, and why did we see the particularly targeted uh, nature of, of, of the crisis in, in, in communities of color? And this is a complicated issue, obviously, there's lots of explanations, but it seems to me that most of the explanations come down roughly on two lines. One is what I would refer to as a demand side explanation, the other is supply side. Let me briefly discuss this. On one side, we have the argument that what happened was a lot of families either were ill-informed or they were greedy, and they took out more loans than they could really afford. And this was supported by poor federal policy enforcement of things like this Community Investment Act, the Fair Housing Act, and other laws that encourage lenders to make a lot of bad loans to low-income people of color that they shouldn't have made, but, but, but lenders felt pressured by these federal agencies to make all these terrible loans. As Neil Cavuto, one of my favorite Fox TV reporters, said that loaning to minorities and risky folks is a disaster. And this is a line you still see being trotted out, and not just on Fox TV seems to me a more accurate explanation and one that is clearly far better supported by the available research evidence on this is what I would call a supply side argument. That a number of things were happening. First, we had aggressive marketers of subprime loans. These were loans that had variable interest rates, they had prepayment penalties, balloon, balloon payments, uh, and these were aggressively marketed by lenders, particularly in traditionally red line neighborhoods. We had fraudulent loan applications. The FBI and the FTC and other agencies have frequently found loan applications where, in some cases, originators simply made up an occupation or made up an income for a family, knowing full well that they would get their fees for originating the loan, and then when they sold it uh, and it was securitized, uh, they would be okay as long as housing values held up. Um, Regulators were not paying attention. A lot of advocacy groups were warning state and federal regulators in the late 90s and early 2000s that this was a problem. Ed Gramlich, who was on the Federal Reserve Board, was telling his colleagues that this was a problem, uh, but regulators basically did not pay attention. Uh, on the CRA issue, I think it's important to point out, as the Federal Reserve did, and the Federal Reserve is not my idea of some kind of left-wing conspiratorial advocacy group, the Federal Reserve pointed out that CRA covered loans, that something like 6% of the loans that they made went to low-income folks in low-income neighborhoods. The overwhelming share of the bad loans were made by independent mortgage bankers and brokers who were not covered by the CRA. And the majority of these loans were actually refinance loans, so it wasn't a matter of talking people who, who shouldn't have become homeowners. These are people that already were homeowners who were talked into uh, these high-priced loans. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence that these loans, in fact, were targeted to traditionally red line neighborhoods. In, in litigation involving Wells Fargo, loan officers were quoted as referring to these loans as ghetto loans for mud people. This didn't leave much to the imagination as to what these loans were all about. Just a, a few numbers, oh here, uh, a few numbers on who was affected. Here I want to suggest four or five reasons why I maintain that the structure of inequality was one of the underlying cause of the crisis. And one of the reasons is because low-income people and people of color are far more dependent on their home equity for the wealth that they can accumulate. So we see that the share of wealth accounted for by home equity for low- and middle-income families was 70% compared to 15% for upper-income folks. Uh, 
For non-whites, it was 62 percent. For whites, it was 42 percent. When we go back to, the, to 2006, which was the, the height of subprime and predatory lending, we see that for African Americans, almost 54 percent of all the home loans they received were subprime, compared to 47 percent for Hispanics and 18 percent for whites. In non-white neighborhoods, almost 47 percent of these loans were high-priced or predatory. In white areas, it was 22 percent. So the folks that were most dependent on home equity for their wealth going into the crisis were the ones who ultimately ended up paying the higher price. Sarah Bloom Raskin, who was then a member of the Federal Reserve and who was now the number two person at Treasury, argued that the foreclosure crisis was largely a result of the fact that the Federal Reserve did not take in consideration the reality of inequality in its, mo in its modeling. Let me just quickly read through this, this statement of hers. The narrative I have emphasized places economic inequality and the differential experiences of American families, particularly the highly adverse experiences of those least well positioned to absorb their realized shocks, closer to the front and center of the macroeconomic adjustment process. The effects of increasing income and wealth disparities, specifically the stagnating wages and sharp increases in household debt in the years leading up to the crisis, combined with the rapid decline in house prices and contraction in credit that followed, may have resulted in dynamics that differ from historical experience and which are therefore not well captured by aggregate models. So the Fed ignored the reality of, of inequality in its efforts to understand what was going on. Related to this is the growing debt, both before the Great, Recession, the Great Depression in the 1920s and 30s and the Great Recession of more recent years. There was a buildup of debt on the part of households, again, particularly low and middle income folks. This is from Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century. I'm curious, has anybody in the room read this book? I, 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 I want to brag, not only did I buy it, but I read it, uh, all 700 pages of it. And I did it because a friend of mine in the history department at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, I asked him if he'd read it. He says, well, he didn't read the current version, but he read the original version in French. And when he told me that, I felt shamed and thought the least I can do is read the English language version. But what Piketty says in his, his celebrated book, in my view, there is absolutely no doubt that the increase of inequality in the United States contributed to the nation's financial instability. The reason is simple. One consequence of the increasing inequality was virtual stagnation of the purchasing power of the lower and middle classes in the United States, which inevitably made it more likely that modest households would take on debt, especially since unscrupulous banks and financial intermediaries freed from regulation and eager to earn good yields on the enormous savings injected into the system by the well-to-do offered credit on increasingly generous terms. The pragmatic policies adopted after the crisis of 2008 no doubt avoided the worst, but they did not really provide a durable response to the structural problems that made the crisis possible, including the crying lack of financial transparency and the rise of inequality. Perhaps the most important contributor, though, is what Joseph Stiglitz talked about in his book, The Price of Inequality. Basically, Stiglitz argued that one of the problems, if not the critical problem of economic inequality, is that it translates into political inequality. Those who were wealthy and powerful exercised even more control of the political process, which means more control over regulation or the lack thereof. And it's the, this spike in economic inequality heightened the the lack of democracy, if you will, in, in the decision-making process that governed the rules and regulations under which our economy operated. He says, if we were serious about deficit reduction, we could easily raise trillions of dollars over the next 10 years simply by raising taxes on people in the top, eliminating loopholes from lower tax rates for speculators and dividends to exemption of municipal interest, eliminating the loopholes that subsidize corporations, taxing rents at higher rates, taxing pollution, taxing the financial sector, at least to reflect in part the cost it has repeatedly imposed on the rest of the economy. Because so many in the 1% derive too much income from the sectors that get these gifts, these proposals have not been the focal points of the standard deficit reduction agenda. And since the recession hit, Several political, political scientists have looked at the phenomenon of inequality, and what they have demonstrated empirically is, first of all, there are different interests on the part of people at different income levels, and elected officials respond differently to those interests. In fact, they respond very positively to the interests of those in the 1% and higher. To you, an, just to illustrate the difference of interest, this is a poll that was reported by the Institute for Policy Studies last year. When asked, should the government see to it that everyone who wants to work can find a job, 
The top 1%, 19% of those said yes, compared to 68% of the general public. When asked should the minimum wage be high enough so that no family with a full-time worker falls below the poverty line, the disparity was 40 versus 78. Should the federal government spend whatever is necessary to ensure that all children have really good public schools? Again, a huge disparity, 35 to 87. People in different income groups have different policy priorities. And it's clear that elected officials have responded accordingly. The last factor that I would offer as illustrating the role of inequality as a cause of the crisis is the reality of segregation. Now, there have been a number of studies that have been produced in recent years showing that subprime lending was concentrate, relatively concentrated in segregated neighborhoods, that segregation was a predictor of the levels of subprime lending. But perhaps the most important paper was one written by Doug Massey and Jacob Rue in the American Sociological Review. I need to hype my profession's journal because nobody else does. They looked at the level of foreclosures across all the metropolitan areas in the United States. And the question they said to themselves is, why are foreclosures higher in some communities than others? And they looked at a whole array of factors. And they found that segregation was the primary cause of the levels of segregation. The segregation was more powerful than creditworthiness, more powerful than level of CRA coverage in a community, more powerful than a whole range of socioeconomic factors, including income, poverty rate, and so forth. It was segregation that helped explain the disparity in foreclosure rates across metropolitan areas. And when you think about it, it, this isn't, it would be shocking if this wasn't the case. When lenders are targeting these loans, which they view as ghetto loans for mud people, it's easier to find the people, the markets that you want to find in segregated communities. Now, I don't want to suggest that it's all been a one-way street, and I realize this slide is unreadable, so don't even try to read it. Uh, but the point here is that there has been some pushback. In fact, the last 30 or 40 years, there is what I would refer to as a community reinvestment infrastructure made up of many of the people in this room and many others. There's groups like the National Fair Housing Alliance, Center for Responsible Lending, um, National Community Reinvestment Coalition, ACORN, yeah, that ACORN, the one that disappeared a few years ago. These are groups that have organized successfully over the last several years and have won many victories. You could say starting with the Fair Housing Act in 1968, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, the Community Reinvestment Act, Dodd-Frank, which created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. There have been a lot of important victories that would not have taken place if it wasn't because of groups like this that were organized and advocating for, for, for these outcomes. And in more recent years, the Department of Justice, along with HUD and other state agencies, have been more aggressive in enforcing banking laws against some of the worst predators. I have just some examples here, and I won't read through all of them. But uh, Wells Fargo uh, reached a $175 million settlement uh, for its discriminatory practices. There was a $25 billion agreement with DOJ, HUD, and 49 attorneys general with the five largest mortgage servicers uh, because of their abusive payment systems. Uh, and, and, and you can see the names here, uh, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley. Uh, these are all major institutions that have settled, uh, fairly, reached fairly substantial settlements. As you've heard reported many times, no executive of any major firm has been sentenced to imprisonment for any of these actions. But I don't think it minimizes the importance of, of what these agencies have done. And more recently, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau delivered $5.3 billion to 15 million victims since it was created in 2011. Now, I would like to argue that one of the forces that has facilitated this kind of pushback was the Occupy Wall Street movement. And people say, well, you know, that was sort of a blip on the screen, a bunch of people that joined a few camps and it all disappeared. But it seems to me the Occupy Wall Street movement has had a permanent impact on what's going on today. And I quote Charles Blow from a September 2013 article that he, or column he wrote in the New York Times, where he said, so the Occupy Wall Street movement, which many dismissed as the whales of the young and disaffected, without clear objectives, clear leaders, or clear, a clear political agenda, may in the end have a rather clear legacy, ingraining in the national conscience the idea that our extreme levels of inequality are politically untenable and morally unacceptable, and that eventually the 99% will demand better.
It wasn't too many years ago where if you were running for elected office and you raised the issue of class or race, you would be accused of being divisive, that you would be fomenting class warfare or playing the race card. It wasn't, frankly, acceptable in polite political circles to talk about these issues. That's changed today. Everybody's talking about inequality. Uh, the president, the pope, the mayor of New York City and others have declared that inequality is, one, is the fundamental economic challenge of the day. I was at a meeting not too long ago where the U.S. Chamber of Commerce talked about inequality being a fundamental problem. Now, their remedy, of course, was tax cuts and deregulation, but they really were acknowledging that this was an issue to be addressed. Um, and that wasn't the case a few years ago. Having said all this, if advocacy groups have pushed back, the industry is also pushing back. So I mentioned the $25 billion settlement. Many of the people who were supposed to receive payments have not received the correct amount. Bonuses and compensation are again reaching record levels. I received something yesterday from the Institute for Policy Studies. Let me just read this to you. It says, in 2014, bonuses on Wall Street added $172,000 on average to the $190,000 Wall, Street average, Wall Streeters average in salary. Uh, 172,000 in bonuses. That was a bigger bonus than I got last year. Uh, I suspect it was bigger than most people got. Uh, as an academic, I got a bonus of zero. Um, and, 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 and there's more here about the, what, 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 what the bonuses are amounted to. In 2014, bonuses amounted to $28.5 billion. The earnings of the 1 million people who's full -time, who work full-time for the minimum wage was 14 million. So we see bonuses, uh, again, reaching very high levels. Uh, the rules that were supposed to be written under Dodd-Frank, about half of the regulations have yet to be written. And this isn't just a, comp you know, a, a coincidence. Lenders are very actively working with regulatory agencies to try to cut back on the rules. They're threatening lawsuits if certain rules are passed. This continues to be contested terrain. We're starting to see some toxic loan products making their way back into the marketplace. Current debate over payday lending, I think, is an example that illustrates this. Um, since Dodd-Frank was passed, the industry has spent over $150 million retaining 3,000 lobbyists to, promulgate, to, to, to fight the promulgation of new rules. Um, and perhaps more problematic, we're seeing a reemergence of traditional redlining practices. Uh, there are a couple of lawsuits that I'm aware of. One was recently settled um, against Santander Bank. It was filed by the city of Providence, Rhode Island, and the settlement involved $1.3 million settlement to three nonprofit housing developers to increase access to affordable housing. Uh, Evans Bank uh, was sued by the state of New York. This has not been settled. Um, and a couple of numbers in that case that I just ran across today that I think are relevant. I think in two, it was in 2012, there were, the, the bank received something like uh, 1,114 applications, four from African Americans. The prosecutors have called this a slam dunk and remains to be seen what happens. Perhaps more problematic, though, is the middle paragraph there that another unreadable part here is, that shows that between 2012 and 2013, the share of loans that went to African Americans and Hispanics declined. So between these two years, the share to African Americans dropped from 5.1 to 4.8 percent after peaking at 8.7 at percent in 2006. In other words, throughout the 90s and 2000s, the share of loans the banks were making to people of color was increasing over time. This was in part because the Clinton administration was enforcing the CRA, advocacy groups were, were using it very effectively, and, and loans to people of color were increasing. Since the, the crisis, the share has gone down. Uh, and again, like I say, we are seeing evidence of traditional forms of redlining appearing. Here is a chart that I received about two weeks ago from Fred Freiberg with the Fair Housing Justice Center in New York. They did a pair testing experiment that they just released. And what they did is they sent out some white and non-white uh, couples to apply for loans. And they assigned characteristics to each of these couples. They made sure they assigned slightly more favorable characteristics to the couple that were people of color so that they would look like better applicants than the white tester. And what they found was in 54% of the tests, whites were quoted higher loan amounts that they would qualify for than were the non-whites. In 34% of the tests, 
the minority tester was quoted a higher loan amount, and at about 12%, they were quoted the same amount. So where do we go from here? What do we do? I guess I would like to suggest that, that bank reform is necessary, but it's not sufficient. That we need to address these broader forms of economic inequality as part of our efforts to address the financial crises and the continuation of the problems created by that crisis. So let me offer us, I'm going to offer a series of recommendations here, none of which are original, I promise you. I've stolen all of these from other sources and from other people. Many of these have been implemented to some extent, some have not, but let me just run through some ideas for you. First of all, in terms of bank reform, we need to modify the CRA so that it covers non-depository financial institutions, the types of institutions that made the kinds of problematic loans that got us where we are. We should allow homeowners to utilize bankruptcy laws as an alternative to foreclosure. This is now prohibited. If it wasn't prohibited, more lenders would have an incentive to modify loans. We should establish a duty of suitability for lenders similar to what stockbrokers have, requiring them to recommend products that are in the client's financial interest. Now Dodd-Frank does require that lenders make sure that people have an ability to repay the loans that they make, which wasn't the case throughout the, the earlier years of the crisis, um, but it remains to be seen how effectively that will be enforced. We should encourage municipalities to use the tool of eminent domain to purchase loans and modify them so families can stay in their homes. I don't know if you've followed this debate at all. The city of Richmond, California has enacted an ordinance that will allow the city to purchase loans uh, at current market value and refinance them so more families can stay in their homes. The industry has responded by saying basically if Richmond or other cities pursue this, they will no longer make loans or insure loans to anybody in those cities. And fair housing lawyers have responded by saying if they do that, that would be blatant redlining and they will see them in court but it remains to see, be seen if anybody actually uses this tool. Let me suggest a few things about ameliorating economic inequality. We could raise the minimum wage and, and index it annually so that it keeps up with inflation. Now, some of you heard of the fight for 15. Uh, there are several cities that have pursued, some have enacted a minimum wage of $15 an hour. Um, uh, the federal government has, I think the current minimum wage is something like 725. Each time the federal government increases the minimum wage, it fails to index it so it loses buying power the minute the law goes into effect. We could expand the earned income tax credit to lift more families out of poverty. We could strengthen union organizing efforts by resuscitating the Employee Free Choice Act that it would allow work workers to form a union when more than 50% sign the card indicating their desire to do so without having to hold an election. We can implement a transaction tax on all sales of stocks, bonds, and related financial institutions, in instruments. We could reduce the disparity in income tax rates for earnings derived from investments, from capital gains, and from labor. We could reduce segregation by providing even more support for grassroots advocacy groups, like many of the folks who are here today. We could expand and strengthen inclusionary zoning rules that are now in place in literally hundreds of communities, requiring more developers to set aside a larger share of homes in new developments for low-income families. Here's one of my favorites. We could ban the mortgage tax deduction in segregated communities. This would make the absence rather than the presence of people of color to be the problem that neighbors would want to solve. We could change the mortgage tax deduction to a credit so families at all income levels can participate. We could retain the disparate impact standard under the Fair Housing Act. Let me talk about that for a moment. As some of you may know, the, uh, the, the Supreme Court is about to issue a ruling this, this term about whether or not there is a disparate impact standard under the Fair Housing Act. HUD issued a rule about a year, year and a half ago. Um, all circuit courts that, that have addressed this issue have ruled that there is a, a disparate impact standard under the Act. HUD and Justice have enforced the Fair Housing Act. Uh, assuming there's a disparate impact standard under both Republican and Democratic administrations. But there's some people on the Supreme Court that wanted to revisit this issue, and it remains to be seen what will happen. I would urge all of you to begin now contacting your congressmen and your senators, local newspaper reporters and editors, and letting them know how important the, the disparate impact standard is. You can go to the web page of the National Fair Housing Alliance and find examples of, of op-eds and various messages that you could use. But it's important, I think, for more people to understand the importance of this standard. And I say this is particularly the case if the Supreme Court should issue a negative decision that somehow compromises disparate impact. 
and, and, and if that does happen, there will be an effort to respond to try to restore the standard, but that will involve a fairly large education and organizing effort, and that could begin now. A couple other quick things I want to mention. It seems to me that, that we also need to think perhaps of some broader ideological responses to the crisis and to the way our economy runs. And, and I begin with, an, and by ideological, what I mean primarily is our almost blind commitment to supposedly free market forces that really aren't free and to the role of private for-profit entities as being the primary movers and shakers and creative producers of, of all economic goods and services. Um, Alan Greenspan, a protege of Ayn Rand, former chair of the, the, the Federal Reserve, acknowledged actually in testifying before the Senate Banking Committee that his commitment, his understanding of the role of markets just didn't work. He said to, to, to um, uh, Henry Waxman, I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, were such that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders and their equity in firms. Waxman, in other words, you found that your, review, your view of the world, your ideology was not right, it was not working. Greenspan, absolutely precisely. Some of you may be familiar with the state-owned Bank of North Dakota. This was created in 1919 when students and, and farmers could not get credit from traditional financial institutions. The state created its own public bank. It has returned a profit to the, to the, to the state, I think, every year since 1919. And today, there are about 25 cities and states that are exploring the possibility of creating a publicly owned bank. I mentioned campaign finance reform because I'm tempted to say nothing good will ever happen in the absence of some kind of campaign finance reform. And my last line here refers to a reference to a book by the, the famed geographer David Harvey, his book, The Enigma of Capital, where he talks about the surplus capital absorption problem. What he means by this is that the crisis we're going through is not a crisis of regulation, Harvey says, it's a crisis of capitalism. And he says what happened is international capital, which is permanently looking for positive returns on its investments, saw mortgages as a potential source of unending profits a few years ago. So they put a lot of money into housing, into mortgages. And with this pool of capital being available, it provided an incentive for a lot of investment banks to get creative and to produce collateralized debt obligations, CDO squared, credit default swaps, and all kinds of derivatives. But if it hadn't been for the availability of that pool of capital that global investors were putting up, we never would have seen the kind of products created that caused the problem. So this raises the question of whether we should be pursuing reform or transformation. And let me just read you a paragraph from Gar Alperovitz's recent book, What Then Must We Do? He says, none of these considerations suggest that reform efforts and progressive movement building should be abandoned. Quite the contrary, both are extremely important. The critical challenge is to find a way as we move ever deeper into a much more profound systemic crisis than many have as yet confronted, to dig much deeper in the quest for a new way forward than we have previously been forced to do. The challenge is to begin to deal directly with the core issue of how wealth is owned and controlled at the heart of the system. If we do this, perhaps future David Cokes of the world will not so cavalierly dismiss future surges of inequality, and maybe we'll have fewer of them. Last brief set of comments I want to offer. We're told the housing market is back, and in some communities it is the case. Housing prices have stopped falling in many communities. This is in part the result of investors who are buying a lot of property to maintain property values and renting it out, it's not necessarily turning anybody into a homeowner. Foreclosures are down below the, the, the peak of the crisis, but still above what they were before the crisis. The recession officially ended a couple years ago. But one reality is that inequality persists. In fact, it continues to increase. Inequality is a central structural characteristic of the U.S. economy. And segregation persists, segregation by race and segregation by class. We see increasing concentrations of poverty and persisting racial segregation. These remain as central defining characteristics of urban and metropolitan areas. And these patterns of uneven development did not occur naturally. They're not automatic. They're the result of public policies and private practices, and different policies and different practices can yield different outcomes. In 1939, Robert Lynn wrote a book, Knowledge for What? The Place of Social Science in American Culture, where he warned that he feared that academics were lecturing on navigation while the ship is going down. 
When I speak before audiences like this, it reminds me that, in fact, we're not lecturing while the ship is going down, that there are people who are attentive to these issues, and there's reason to believe that tomorrow will be different from today. That I'm happy to answer questions if there's time, or even happier if there isn't. You know, my short answer is I believe there has been, and, and I'm not all that familiar with that literature, but I know we're constantly hearing that if, that if we do something that creates a disincentive, people won't do what they ought to do. Let me tell a story. I, I testified before the Montgomery County uh, Local City Council a few years ago. Tom Perez, the Secretary of Labor, was on the council at the time, and they were debating a predatory lending ordinance, and people from a couple of the banks said that if they pass this ordinance, uh, credit will dry up. And somebody on the council said to, to this person, he says, I hear this all the time. I'm always told if we pass rules, business is going to flee, and we never see any evidence of it. He says, please tell me which loans you're going to walk away from. Is it the $1 million loans in Bethesda, or is it the $2 million loans in Potomac? And everybody in the room laughed, and that was the end of that discussion. So I, I think that the profit motive is still there uh, if, if, you know, if you place some limits on that. You, you can make the same argument for any, you could say we shouldn't have a fair housing law or, 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 or Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If you require employers to not discriminate, you reduce their flexibility and, and, and re their incentive to invest in your community. Thank you, Thank you so much. Sir.